Good morning, welcome to Boston. Uh, my name is David Kraft. I'm gonna talk about uh, personalized cancer treatments. First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, my background, just to give you some sense of where I'm coming from on this one. Um, I spent the bulk of my career, for, first of all, I'm trained as an engineer. I worked a little bit at GE, doing some engineering a long time ago. Uh, I took my PhD at MIT in something called operations research, which is basically a math for the real world. And then I moved on to uh, MGH's radiation oncology department. Uh, for a long time there, I worked on that problem on the right, um, uh, radiation treatment planning, which is we, we bring in thousands of beam, uh, uh, radiation beams subdivided into small beamlets from many directions and optimize each of these beamlets simultaneously, individually to create a tumor, a dose to the tumor that maximally covers the tumor and spares the rest of the um, structures as best as possible. And this was actually commercialized and it's used all over, the, the stuff that we did in my lab is used all over the world now in a product called Ray Station. Um, but after working on this problem for a long time, it occurred to me that there's something of a little elephant in the room. Um, and that elephant that I threw on there is uh, representing this idea that some patients do well with radiation and some people don't do well with radiation and it's, it, it can be actually sometimes night and day. We give the same radiation plan to a same type of patient and some people succeed and some people don't. And that's obviously, well maybe not obviously, but that's a much harder problem to work on. If we could solve that problem we'd, we'd, we'd be doing a, a pretty great job. So that's the problem I want to turn to today. And it's not, it's not just radiation, it's also drugs. Uh, it's a very general problem. What, what drugs to give what patients? So I think it's fairly easy to imagine a setting like this, where one takes a tumor biopsy from a cancer patient, does a full genomic characterization of it, um, and, and by that I mean calling the mutations, calling, uh, g cancer is full of genetic genomic abnormalities. Chromosomes break, they rearrange. They copy each other, uh, there's sections that are copied over and over again. So you have multiple copies of segments of genes. Uh, and you have mutations all over the place. Hundreds of mutations in, in, a, in a cancer patient's tumor cell. Uh, hundreds of different types of cells sometimes. I mean, cancer is not one thing. It's a bunch of cells who've, that have all gone awry. So, but it's easy to at least imagine, sorry, uh, back. It's easy to imagine at least this workflow where you take the genetic information, send it into a trained machine learning algorithm, and then provide a treatment recommendation. What I want to talk about today is the steps we're taking to, to, to get there and the analysis and the investigations we're doing. So I'll talk a lot about what's in that box up there. What do we need? We need data, clearly. We need algorithms. I think data is a bigger thing. And, and I, I'm, I, I'm a big proponent of the idea that we need structural biological knowledge, biological knowledge that we can harness and use into the machine learning algorithms, not just biological knowledge that's sitting there in these giant textbooks that a lot of people have in their offices and, you know, pathway diagrams and whatnot, but computable, computable knowledge. Uh, and th this will all go to solving the mismatch of patients to drugs. Uh, okay. So a sl somewhat simpler problem is to think about the same problem in a Petri dish. The reason I start with this, and, and my lab works on this problem also, is there's a lot more data available and one can kind of understand, I'm sorry that a lot of these are really small, but I'm gonna show you why I put these pictures up, just talk you through it. Um, over at Cancer Rx Gene, which is a collaboration between MGH and Sanger, people have taken a thousand different cancer, human derived cancer cell lines, so here we are sitting there with basically a thousand patients and, and uh, in, in, in cell lines that you can do whatever you want with, they're just, they're just cell lines. Um, of all sorts of different types of cancer origins and 265 different drugs and put all those drugs at different levels on those cell lines and we get these dose response curves. What we find is that these are different drugs and these are how often that they are the most successful drugs to be used. And every drug, almost every drug on this line is above zero, meaning that at least it's, it's, it's one of the top drugs for some one of these cancers. Over here we see, what, what, what I show here is two drugs from this data set, trametinib, and I list the top cell lines that that drug killed. Trametinib, as you may know, is a MEK inhibitor that's typically used for melanoma, but if, if, if I were better make, make, making it a better person to make slides, you would see that this, this does not all say melanoma. That's a whole host of different disease sites. So we don't actually know when trametinib is gonna be most, most useful, and for, in fact, for some melanoma patients, it isn't useful. Meanwhile, the same story for gemcitabine, which is a more uh, general purpose chemotherapy. 
uh, the, the cell lines that this gem cytobeam is effective for are all over the map. Meaning it's very hard, this data indicate that it, it's very hard to tell what the best drug choice is even for these cell lines. We just can't, we can't do it. Why is it so hard? It's hard because of the diversity of cancers. I want to take a little, almost like a little, maybe a morning break into the, some, some fun biology. I think we all know that the DNA molecule is responsible for all of life on Earth. And this one molecule can, can, can be so, it's so long and so combinatorially interesting, it can give rise to all sorts of things, mussels, pitch pine, octopus, frog, and it's just a DNA molecule. It, it, this gives some sense of the diversity this molecule can produce. Even in, within a person, we have a DNA molecule, but without any mutations to that DNA, we generate all these different types of cells, neurons, liver cells, sperm cells. These are fundamentally different cells behaving differently with the same, with no mutations, with no copy number changes, Sa same DNA. Then you take a cancer, and then the DNA starts to, starts to change, and you have all sorts of different liver cancer cells. One liver cancer cell is not the same as every, anyone else's liver, because there's different mutations. These different mutations give, give rise to very complex systems that are hard to predict. How will these things react to a particular drug? In fact, just saying you have a certain mutation is kind of like the very beginning of a story. Here's a P53, a snapshot of the P53 gene. These are some of the different mutations across the top here that one could possibly have in P53. Meaning if someone says to you, you have a mutation in P53, the most famous cancer gene of all time, that doesn't really tell you much because it could be any of these mutations and they probably all act quite differently. So it's a bit of an overwhelmingly complicated problem which is why I start in cell lines. And even be before that, I, 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 uh, next slide I'll tell you something else. But, um, well, first, uh, why study this problem? Cancer care is, is expensive. We have half a million people dying every year from cancer. It, it would obviously be great to assign the right drug to the right patient at the right time. Um, better for everybody, better for the patients, better for the providers, better for the payers. Uh, a, a course of therapy today looks something like this. As most of you know, anybody who's seen a person go through late stage cancer, it, it's diagnosis, it's surgery, it's radiation, it's chemo, it's recurrence again, it's another chemo. It's a real mess, it's really painful. Many of these drugs don't work, many of these approaches don't work. Wouldn't it be nice if it looked like this? Diagnosis, surgery, optimally selected treatment, long-term remission, cure. That's what we're thinking about and shooting for. Um, I, there's a couple things going on here. I mean, there's many, many things going on. This, uh, these are complex systems that we simulate in the lab in order to have a ground truth data set to test algorithms on. By testing algorithms, what we show is that I want, I want you to pay, this graph is, more data is as we go to the right. We get more data, we get more classification accuracy. The, the bars generally go up. But the green here shows that if we incorporate prior knowledge into the system, a lot of people go about this blindly, like give me the data and let me crunch through it and assume the machine can do it. But that has not been successful yet. Nobody is doing this in the, in the clinic yet for the most part. Um, these green things indicate somehow I put more prior knowledge into, into the machine learning algorithm and, and we do significantly better, especially in low data settings. What is low data settings for this? How many cancer patients do we need to have on file or in the database? Nobody really knows, but I suspect it's a huge, huge number because of the diversity of cancers. Um, so if you take home one thing from my talk, it's the idea that prior knowledge, when folded in, can actually improve the, can dramatically improve the performance of machine learning algorithms. Um, so what do we need to, to make this, this happen? A multidisciplinary team of scientists. This is, this is a problem that has a lot of different crazy heads. Um, systems biologists, people who think about biology at a system level instead of just one gene and one pathway. Um, data scientists, this is going to be a huge data effort. Clinical scientists to know that whatever we develop is clinically implementable and we're not just out there in the cloud somewhere. Um, machine learning specialists too because I believe once we get all this new data we're going to need some machine learning and these people are all going to need to talk to each other. Uh, I think open source data sharing and patient reported outcomes are all key, key things we're going to need for this. And uh, who's going to benefit? First and foremost, the patients, but also the payers. I mean, we, we waste a lot of money on, on, I mean, a ton of money on, here, here hopefully, hopefully this drug works and it doesn't work. And these are expensive drugs. Um, and the physicians are going to be uh, better physicians if they're giving the right drugs and the right treatments to patients. Thanks very much. <laughs>